um, the end positive neck. We're going to run this video here. Um, it's really a procedure that's been in evolution for many years. If you look back at the history of neck dissection and removing of nodes back from early people such as Bill Roth and Langenbeck through to the more recent times, and, and, and certainly we've heard a lot about Hayes Martin and, um, and Kreil, the concepts have always been about removing bulk of disease and then it moved forwards to on-block resections. Selective neck dissections have become very vogue even for, um, for positive and positive disease. And we're left with a flurry of names such as selective, super selective neck dissections, comprehensive neck dissections. Um, neck dissection as where we come from, we think of as, um, as just removing the nodes. Everybody needs a hero. This is my hero, my partner Rajan <laughs> Patel. Um, and Rajan is, and I are performing a comprehensive neck dissection today for metastatic skin cancer. So the first thing I want to talk through is placement, placement of the patient and marking. Very important, we like to have the patient positioned with a head ring and a shoulder roll. The shoulder is down, the ear is exposed. In this particular patient, the clinically positive nodes we've detected are in level five, um, low in the neck, level two, and a parotid node. Marking the incisions, we've just been hearing quite interesting talk about minimal morbidity with neck incisions. If a patient's got an end positive neck, we, we, we do, do quite large incisions. We often drop a lower limb to get down to level five, especially if we're going to be removing external jugular nodes. We drop the vertical body of the limb over the sternocleidomastoid muscle if possible, because we know these patients can have post op radiotherapy. We also like to put a little notch in the bottom here to prevent contracture, particularly during uh, post op radiotherapy. In raising the flaps, one of the key things we look for and try and identify early are the external jugular vein and the greater and the greater auricular. Coming through platysma, as Jesus mentioned, we like attraction and counter-traction. So initially we don't use retractors, we keep everything flat. We like to operate with a monopolar diathermy with a smoke evacuator. <coughs> One Neil calls the suction the, the, the vacuum cleaner or the hoover. Uh, we work, work on a broad front um, and at this stage the patient is, is not paralyzed so we can look for marginal nerve. We find the mandible early, we identify the external jugular vein um, and the great auricular and stay above these. The concepts around end positive neck as opposed to our on block resections, we tend to work around disease uh, with a pathological dissection rather than an anatomic dissection. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple about some of the difficult areas, the corners of consternation. So working around disease, we don't always stay in a subplatismal plane. If necessary, we'll leave either parotid capsule, SMAS, or platysma down on top of disease so we don't get a positive margin. Also, we won't necessarily go for the main facial trunk. We'll come retrograde from anterior to posterior, chasing the, the nerve along. We do a wide exposure to make sure we can clear the low level five nodes, particularly in metastatic skin. So Jesus didn't really show you level five, particularly in metastatic skin, level five is something which is a bit of a dying art. Um, to get posterior exposure, we stay along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, relatively superficial, external jugular vein left down. What we're looking for at this stage in our subcutaneous plane is we're heading for the trapezius muscle. We're trying to find the trapezius, identify it, and stay on its superior border. And that will help delineate the most posterior aspect of our dissection. The next step is finding the spinal accessory nerve, and there's a number of ways of doing that. In particular, with a posterior dissection, we go for Herb's point, which is a lot more reliable than you think. Approximately 1.5 to 2 centimeters above the greater auricular nerve. With a couple of spreads of the hemostat, you can find the nerve. The nerve's then traced 
a la parotid dissection, posteriorly back towards the trapezius using a hemostat. The other way of finding the nerve, and we tend to do this early, particularly a way of freeing up the top end, is finding it under the digastric. So we'll often take a small cuff of sternocleidomastoid muscle. If there is a little bit of ECS around there, particularly protonodes off in the way, we don't necessarily take the whole muscle, especially if we're having post-op radiotherapy. We like to leave some muscle behind. So we'll look for our posterior belly to digastric, get a retractor under that, and mobilize to find, as you can see here, the upper, upper end of the jug and then the spinal accessory nerve sitting on top or close by that. Well, we can then follow that back down to the front of the sternomastoid muscle in a very safe manner, instead of randomly trying to find it where it enters the muscle. The nerve's then dissected free, um, just with um, either a scissor or with a blade. Once the spinal accessory nerve has been isolated at the top end. We head to the bottom end and we free the fascia off the front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle using a monopolar diaphermy and again working on a broad front. This is an area where you need to be careful because you can actually rotate the sternomastoid out too much and injure the um, spinal accessory nerve lower down. But what we're looking for here is omohyoid muscle. We're going to take that down towards the clavicle and then follow it where, uh, where it comes through the um, sternomastoid underneath at the back. We've, we've followed the accessory all the way into the trapezius muscle where it's entered, and we're going to work down that and find and divide omohyoid and then just go straight to the bottom end and find our low level five. For this, we've started using the harmonic scalpel, both to divide the, um, the omohyoid, but also to use some of the tr troublesome lymphatics and vessels that you find in dealing with this area. So once the accessory has been dissected to trapezius, we use blunt dissection to separate off the uh, low level 5 fat from the deep axillary fat to get our plane and bring that forwards towards the internal jugular vein. <coughs> Dissecting high up above the um, accessory nerve, which we've already isolated, um, again, broad um, exposure with good retraction of across the sternomastoid. And what we're doing here is we're heading down towards the spinal accessory nerve, which you can see has got a vessel loop around it, and you can still use the monopoda at this point. Elevating it off the levator, and then passing that back through underneath um, the sternocleidomastoid as it's dissected above the accessory. The idea here is to try and get everything delivered medially and all on one plane. Once that step's complete, we can deal with the lower internal jugular vein and lymphatics, which is also an area which can cause some problems. We like to do this with a combination of blunt dissection, um, and we always try and identify the lymphatics if possible using a valsalva with the anesthetist. So here we've got good retraction on the lower end. We're dividing the fascia over the internal jugular vein. We're going to blunt dissect at this bottom end to try and find um, our thoracic duct where it's sitting around the back of the jug. We'll, we'll almost always find it in the ligar clifford if possible. We tend to be very aggressive with these metastatic skin um, uh, dissections, particularly low level five, and our, our rate of car leaks quite high. Once that's happened, we can deliver the entire level five medially to the inside using a Penrose drain to hold back, and the only thing that's left then um, in the way is our spinal accessory nerve. So once that's all in one plane, um, we can follow our um, accessory nerve and release it. Um, and then that's the entire level five uh, with the nerve intact. It's in a simple manner to um, follow what has just said before, um, work along the carotid sheath. Um, we like to do that um, with sharp dissection, dissecting out separately the internal jugular vein, um, the, um, the uh, vagus and the carotid. Um, we work up that with a knife. And the top end is often hard, but because we've medialized all that material, we can get a nice retractor underneath digastric and then pull down, and we can quite easily free that material from the upper end of the jug. 
then we continue to dissect the carotid um, with a combination of sharp and blunt dissection. And we follow the omohyoid muscle all the way back up to the hyoid um, uh, to finish off uh, our level 5 dissection. You can note that the external jugular chain has also been taken off the sternocleidomastoid at this point, and the whole thing's been brought forwards. Um, so we're left with our carotid and internal jug, vagus, accessory, and our sternomastoid intact. Uh, the rest of the dissection is Ella, as uh, has also shown before. Um, we close with um, irrigating the wound with warm saline, a valsalva, checking for a chyle leak, hemostasis, and suction drains. So in summary, um, we, we, when we have metastatic nodes, we go for wide exposure. We work around disease from a known area to an unknown area. We mobilize the top and bottom end of the sheath early. We do good muscle retraction. We need a good assistant. We take EJ nodes that are at risk. Thank you very much.